copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. us back 26 years when policemen were walking their beat, when it took an hour or more for police to arrive at the scene of a crime, when horses were considered more dependable than motorized fire engines, when ambulances usually arrived as an accident too late to help the victim. Today it takes most radio equipped police cars less than two minutes, often less than 60 seconds to answer your call for help, and police give much of the credit for this greater speed to Rio Grande cracked gasoline. No other gasoline in this market, they point out, can start so fast, accelerate so rapidly, develop so much power as Rio Grande cracks. Because Rio Grande is the only refiner in the West licensed to refine gasoline by the patented Sinclair cracking system. This exclusive process breaks up the atoms of gasoline so that the inefficient, lazy, slow-burning units are extracted, leaving only concentrated energy. There's no waste with Rio Grande cracks. For the cracking process ensures that every atom is turned into power so that you consistently get greater mileage with Rio Grande cracked gasoline. As proof of the superior efficiency and many advantages of Rio Grande cracked, we point out that contracts have been placed for the cities of Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, Modesto, Merced, Lodi, San Diego County, Maricopa County, Arizona, and many, many others, specifying that Rio Grande cracked gasoline exclusively be used in all police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment. So when you get Rio Grande crack from your neighborhood independent dealer, you can enjoy police car performance at a lower cost per mile. pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. Every large American city seems to have some great catastrophe in its history which its citizens never forget. In Chicago, it is the Iroquois Theater Fire. In San Francisco, it is the Great Fire which followed the earthquake in 1906. Here in Los Angeles, we have been fortunate in escaping such tremendous calamities. But we do have our own past, a horrible holocaust which can never be erased from the memories of living men. I refer to the dynamiting of the Los Angeles Times building in 1910. Consistent with my effort to show you citizens how your police force operates, I am presenting tonight the story of this famous case only from the point of view of the commission of the crime and the splendid detective work which finally resulted in the apprehension and conviction of all the criminals involved. In doing so, it is not my purpose nor intent to champion either side of the argument. Tonight, in telling the story of the times, we are interested in facts, not opinions, in police work, not economic propaganda. So, with this brief explanation, I turn to Frederick Lindsley, who will carry on with the story of the Times building. It is one o'clock in the morning of October 1st, 1910. While the city sleeps, a band of men who toil by night and rest by day is working at top speed. From the far corners of the world, another page of history's book has been assembled. The morning paper is going to press. 
In the composing room on the second floor of the Times, building a line of men, green eye shades clamped to their heads, clatter at the linotype machines. In the engraving room on the sixth floor, mercury lamps throw their ghoulish glare. The dog watch in the city room sleepily eyes the clock, hoping that no big story will break to disturb their thumb and knees until 30 comes for them at half past four. Seated by their silent telegraph keys, two men stand by in the wire room for last-minute news flashes. In the basement, the huge presses hungrily await the plates for the final edition. Horses and wagons stand ready in the alley to dash away with the ink wet edition to carriers all over the city that Los Angeles may have her news for their morning coffee. The hands of the clock slowly move on. Activity increases as press time approaches. It is now one five, one six. In ink alley by the press room, another clock ticks ominously. Unnoticed by any of the busy workmen in the building. The second pass. The clock says one seven. And then... There's a roar that is heard ten miles. The center of the time building blows up. The force of the explosion snaps the girders supporting the second and third walls until there were two sticks in the hands of Primo Conera. Down into the gaping hole hurtled the heavy liner type and fury typing machinery, carrying their operators to a crushing death. The gas main which feeds the building is ripped open and instantly ignited. A searing thousand of flame leaps through the building. Within a moment, the entire structure is ablaze. Workmen clutched in the freezing mass of horror rush to the fire escape, be met by a fiery wall through which escape is an impossibility. The two telegraph editors trapped in their room slowly burn to death. Some positives and line of life operators, horribly maimed, arms torn off and legs broken, lie helpless on the floor as the vicious fire creeps toward them. Their pitiful cries reach the street below, where all the downtown fire operators have already arrived, but rescue is an impossibility. No man can enter that seething funeral pyre and live. The reporters and editors on the dark watch in the city room of the third floor are forced to jump to the street. Those who survive the jump are crippled for life. Within a few minutes after the explosion, the last cry of the helpless victim trapped within the building has been smothered in the fevered embrace of the flames. In an astonishingly short time, the entire building is gutted. And then a new danger threatens. As one after the other, the wall, watching in its support, waves the water and flash to the street. When a huge cloud has been hurled from the depths of the explosion, are screaming at the hastily rigged guard ropes. All night long, the fire rages, completely ruining the plant of the pine. Yet just a little later than usual the next morning, the Times is delivered to its subscribers, printed at an emergency plant for the battered, bruised, and bandaged survivors of the catastrophe. And early the same morning, Sam Brown, chief of detectives in the district attorney's office, takes over the investigation of the crime on telegraph order from district attorney Don D. Frederick, who is in Mexico on a vacation. Brown and his force hold a council of war. Well, you all saw that thing burn last night. You've all investigated as much of the ruins as you could. Anybody got any ideas? Oh, I'm nothing here about it. It's a mystery to me. There is one lead, though. Or guess, I should say. What's that? Well, General Otis, the owner of the Times, has a lot of holdings in Mexico. A big ranch or something. No. No, you're wrong in that hunch. That building wasn't blown up on that account. My guess is that it's a labor battle. Well, you might be right, sir. Hey, Sam, here's a lovely little clue. What have you got in that suitcase? Dynamite. 80% dynamite. Well, for the love of Mike, keep it out of here. Oh, it's all right now. I disconnected the farming apparatus. Oh. Where'd you get it? It was left at V. Handler's house. V. Handler? Who's he? Secretary of the Merchants and Manufacturers Association. That proves that this is a labor battle. Well, let's see what this thing's made of. All right, here you are. Pack full of sticks of 80% dynamite. It's a simple mechanism. Two dry cells for juice and the circuit breaker welded to the alarm handle of this clock here. Mm -hmm. Let me see that clock. Let's see. Set for one o'clock. It was to go off at the same time as the times blew up. They must have used the same kind of bomb there. But whoever did it was trying to say it go on alarm clock. The spring on this one wasn't strong enough to make the electric connection. Just a minute, I'll get it. District Attorney's Office, Sam Brown speaking. Yeah? Well, listen. It's the same kind as we've got here. Yeah. Open it up and disconnect the batteries. That's right. Then bring it in here. Okay. That was a patrolman. He just answered a call from General Otis Hall. 
They found a strange suitcase hidden in the shrubs under the general's window this morning. Whoever blew up the time sure wanted to make a complete job of it. We sure did. Let's take a look at this dynamite. Oh. Mammoth Powder Company, Marin County, California. Yeah. I sort of expected the plot started in San Francisco. Well, there's dynamite to lead. Boys, get packed up. We're leaving for San Francisco tonight. Brown, accompanied by a staff of operatives, arrives in San Francisco and sets up headquarters at the downtown hotel. That afternoon, he interviews Mr. Roller, manager of the Mammoth Powder Works across the bay. And uh, as far as you can remember, all your sales of dynamite during the past two months were to legitimate buyers, eh? Yes, Mr. Brown. I can't recall sales to anyone but my regular customers. I beg pardon, Mr. Roller. Yes, Miss Adams? There was that man who came in a launch with some dynamite. Said he was blasting stumps on his ranch. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. I've never seen him before, and I... Do you remember I remarked on the fact that the launch had new letters on it? When was it? Well, I should say about six weeks ago. What was the man's name? Oh, let me see. Well, just a minute. I have the order in the file somewhere. What, uh, what does this fellow look like, Mr. Roller? Well, I remember he was medium height, had brown eyes, and of course it's so long ago. Yes, I understand, but uh, can you remember anything else about him? Let's see. Oh, yes. He cocked his head to one side when he talked to you. Like this. Here it is, Mr. Roller. The man's name was J.B. Bright. J.B. Bright, eh? Did he give any address? No, he called for the dynamite in the lawn. There was another man with him. Seemed to have a cast in his eye. He might have been glass. The two of them loaded the dynamite in the launch and went away. How much dynamite did they buy? This invoice shows five cases. Mm. Hey, you said there was something strange about the name of the launch. Yes, it seemed as though the original name had been painted over and a new name spelled on it. What was that name? It was the Peerless, and the name was spelled in bright new metal letters. Oh, you mean uh, those aluminum letters that you can buy in hardware stores? Yes, that was the kind. Mm-hmm. That's fine. <laughs> I'm afraid that's not much help. Well, indeed it is, young lady. You've helped us a great deal. Searching every hardware store in San Francisco in an effort to find the one which has sold aluminum letters spelling the word peerless. The other half he sends scouring the waterfront for the missing launch. A hardware store is found which had sold the letters to a man who gave his name as J.B. Bryce. And a day later the launch is discovered at a pier in the Mission District. This launch had been rented to one J.B. Bryce. Brown and his men gather in the hotel room to decide the next step. Well, one thing is clear. The man we want is J.B. Bryce. Well, probably that's not his real name. Undoubtedly, it's phony, but I'd just as soon arrest him under that name as any other. There's a great variation in these descriptions, though. Yeah, but they all have one characteristic in common. This man, Bryce, cocks his head on one side when he talks to you. Say, Sam, here's the lead. Huh? This cab driver here knows our man, Bryce. You do? Well, I don't know him, but I carried him in my cab plenty of time. Where do you live? I don't know that. I used to take him to Singapore Jim's down on the Barbary Coast. He was nuts about music, and there was a violin player down there who used to play in the Tramurai or something until he fell asleep. Yeah? What else? Well, he went around to the dame. Swell look as she was. <laughs> he called her his dollar movement girl. I never knew her by any other name. Dollar movement girl, eh? Yeah. Anything else you know about him? No, that's about all. Hmm. Well, uh, you'll be around if we want you, won't you? Sure, my stand's right outside the hotel here. Good. Well, thanks very much. Not at all. Glad to help you. Well, I knew huh? That's a funny thing to call a dame. Mm-hmm. Maybe she was, just that. Maybe. But I got a hunch there's a lead there. Dollar movement, girl. <laughs> I wonder if her name could be Ingersoll. Ingersoll? What do you mean? Well, Ingersoll is the name of a dollar watch, eh? Ah, oh, come on, Sam. That's too easy. You're not solving a crime like a damn novel. Maybe so, but I've got a hunch I'm right. I want you guys to cover the mission district for a woman by the name of Ingersoll. Maybe I'm crazy, but I think we're on the right track. Brown is right. 
that men finally discovered an attractive young woman who admits knowing Bryce. Brown questioned her. So, uh, Miss Ingersoll, when was the last time you saw Bryce? Oh, about three weeks ago. You haven't seen him since? No. Well, where has he been the past three weeks? Well, he said he had to go to Los Angeles on some business. What was his business? I don't know. He never told me. Uh-huh. And I didn't ask. He always had plenty of money, and he treated me wonderfully. I bought me a fur coat just a month ago. Oh, Andy. Uh, where did he live when he was in San Francisco? Oh, I don't know. Well, didn't you have his telephone number? Yeah, I believe I did have it around here somewhere. Uh, let me look in this drawer. Yeah, here it is. Uh, on this piece of cardboard. Hmm. Uh, that's the sort of cardboard the laundry put into men's shirts, isn't it? Yeah, I guess it is. He changed his shirt here one night. Uh, that's all. And then he left me this number. The telephone number is that of the Argonaut Hotel. Inquiring, Brown discovers that Bryce had lived there while in San Francisco. There he interviews the room clerk, the bellboys, the bartender, all of whom had known Bryce. From each, he gets a description, discovers intimate facts about Bryce's habits, even to the name of his favorite cocktail. However, his investigation in San Francisco fails to reveal Bryce's present whereabouts, so Brown returns to Los Angeles, where his case against Bryce is found to be so complete that the attorney for the Merchant and Manufacturers Association is able to appear before the grand jury and obtain an indictment for murder in the first degree against one J.B. Bryce, fugitive. Once the identity of the suspect is established, Brown makes the first step toward the apprehension. In one of the rooms of the floor set aside for the Times bombing investigation, Brown has a table several yards long and six feet wide. It is covered with papers. Brown is working over it intently when one of his colleagues approaches. Hey, with a lemon mic, Sam, what are you doing? Huh? Setting place cards for a banquet? No, Bob, I'm trying to describe Bryce. What do you mean? Well... When we were in San Francisco, we ran down dozens of people who'd seen Bryce. We got a description from him from each one. And almost every description varied. Well, that doesn't explain this table a block long. It's simple. I've broken down the descriptions into their elements. See? Over here, each sheet of paper in this section has one person's description of Bryce's eyes. Then comes the description of his hair, and so on. I'm trying to reconstruct Bryce from all these descriptions. When I get through, he'll have the eyes the majority said he had, and his hair will be the color most people thought it was. So on. Well, I'll be... Say, I never thought I'd get a description like that. Well, neither did I. I just figured it out as the only way to get an agreement out of all these people's opinions. Working day and night, Brown finally arrives at the description of the missing Bryce, which is a cross-section of all the descriptions given him by various witnesses in San Francisco. Then he has more than 200,000 circulars printed, reading, wanted, dead or alive, and describing Bryce. These circulars are mailed to every post office in the world, from New York City to the Khyber Pass, from Spitsburg and Sierra del Fuego. They go to every steamship dock, to every railroad station, and every hotel and saloon in North America. Months pass. Then one night in a bar room in Chicago. Hey, Tom. Yes, sir? Uh, what's the matter with you, Tom? You think my friend and me are camels? What's the big idea? What's the big idea? So did I'm sorry if there's something wrong, sir. Something wrong? I'll tell you something's wrong. What'd you take that bottle away for? Now, come on and bring it back and we'll fill up these glasses again, you big hop. Just right away, sir. Right away. Yeah, and you see it is right away. I'll be son of a secret. What? Hey, look here, Mike. This sign here. Wanted, dead or alive for dynamiting and murder. J.B. Bryce. Height, 5 feet 8. Weight, 140. High cheekbones and sharp features and squinty blue gray eyes and brown hair. Hey, can you imagine that? Jim McNamara to a T, even if there isn't a picture here. How did they get the good description? He blew right after the job, didn't he? Sure, he blew. Say, you know, this Sam Brown is a smart dick. Well, else he's a mighty good guesser. Here you are, sir. So, well, Jim ain't got nothing to worry about, Mike, so long as they ain't got a picture of him. You know, they're looking for a J.B. Bryce. Jim McNamara is safe enough. Hey, what are you nipping for? Come on, I'll go about your business. I, I, I beg your pardon. 
I just wondered if I could get you anything else. No, you can when you can outside. You come on now. Very good, sir. Very good. Hey, Eddie, take over for a minute, will you? I'm going to the watch room. Ah. Hello, operator. Get me the police department. Yes. Hello? Listen, Sergeant. This is Tom Henry speaking. Yes, don't, don't hear the shepherds in the loop. Say, I got a line on that guy that's wanted for bombing in Los Angeles. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, will, will I get the reward? Why, sure, it's on the up and up. Okay, you better hurry over here right away. <laughs> Off for the bartender, Chicago police shadow the girl as Audie McManagle. When a few days later, McManagle boards a train for Detroit, two Chicago detectives sit a few seats behind him, and Detroit detectives are on the platform when the train arrives at its destination. Well, she's on time. Yeah. You know these Chicago boys that are shadowing the guy? Yeah, I worked on a case with Harris. I don't know the other guy. Hey, Frank. Yeah? You know that guy with the black suitcase waiting there at the passenger's exit? Yeah. Look closely. Fit the description of that Bryce wanted in Los Angeles. Yeah, he does. Come on, let's take him in. Wait a minute. There comes Harris and his partner coming down the platform. Let's see if the guy that's shadowing knows us. All right. Yeah, he's shaking hands with him. There's Harris and his partner moving in. Come on, let's go. In the suitcase of J.B. Bryce, a veteran with McManagle is found material for making six clockwork bombs, several revolvers, and a demountable rifle with Maxim silencer. Bryce stoutly maintains his innocence, but McManagle's quick confession to numerous other dynamiting jobs identifies Bryce as James B. McNamara and implicates him in the dynamiting of the time. McNamara, stoutly protesting his innocence, is extradited to Los Angeles to face trial for murder in the first degree. Matt Namara maintains a stubborn resistance to his captors, refusing to cooperate with them in any way, refusing even to be fingerprinted. Sam Brown, ever resourceful, has a plan to obtain fingerprints. He calls Priscilla Hitchcock, attractive young operative, into his office. Did you want to see me, please? Yes, Priscilla. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to make a newspaper woman out of you. What? You mean you're leaving me? <laughs> no, Priscilla, not that. Oh. But, uh, I want you to go over to the jail and talk to McNamara. Tell him you're a reporter and you want to write a series of interviews about him, uh, well, from the woman's angle. Yes, and then what? Well, that remains to be seen. Report to me when you get back, huh? For several days, Priscilla visits McNamara daily in his cell. Then, once more, she reports to her chief for further instructions. Uh, how are you and Jim getting along? I can't say that I like this assignment, Chief, having him paw me. What do you mean? What does he do? Well, if you ask me, he's woman crazy. It isn't what he does so much as what I read in his eyes. Yes, but uh, tell me what he does. Well, nothing. I talk to him, and when I get up to leave, he always grabs me by the arm. Yeah. I was figuring on him doing something like that. Where does he grab you? Just above the elbow. And he looks into my eyes real deep and says, uh... Goodbye, cutie. Mm. The way he looks at me that I don't like. Well, don't worry, Priscilla. I think this will be your last visit. Ooh, what lovely white kid gloves. Are they a present for me? Uh, well, yes, and uh, no. Oh. Uh, just another of my crazy ideas. Put them on, will you? Oh, gee, they're lovely. Let me go way above my elbows. Yeah, that's just it. Now, uh, run along and see your friend Jim. An hour later, Priscilla is back in Brown's office. Well, how did you go? No, the same. Do I have to go back there again? Did he grab you by the arms and call you cutie? Yes, and dirtied my nice white glove. Let's see. Mm. Fine. Fine. That's just what I wanted. Now. What's the razor blade for? Don't move, Priscilla. I'm about to ruin those nice new gloves of yours. Oh, Joe, I can get them clean. Don't you dare. Wait till I get these sleeves cut off here. Yeah. Now, don't touch them. Look, Priscilla. 
Did you ever see a prettier set of fingerprints in your life, eh? As the court convenes for the selection of jurors to try McNamara, Brown begins the first mental third degree in police history. Each day he has several seats reserved in the first row opposite the counsel's table. And each day these seats are unobtrusively occupied by some of the many witnesses he discovered in San Francisco who were known to McNamara. One day a bellboy and a cab driver. The next, the bartender who mixed McNamara's favorite highball. And the tailor who pressed his clothes. And while McNamara, more and more unnerved, watches these silent figures from his past who give no sign of recognizing him, Brown sits facing the bomber, never taking his eyes from his face. Finally, McNamara objects to his counsel. Your Honor, I want this man, Brown, removed from the court. Why? There he sits and stares at my client. He makes him nervous. Yes. He's trying to force me to a false confession. Bringing all these witnesses in here. He's trying to intimidate me. I can see no objection to Mr. Brown's remaining in the courtroom, nor do I understand the defendant's reference to witnesses. We are still in paneling a jury. No witnesses have been introduced as yet. McNamara's nervous objection to Brown's mental third-degree methods is a fatal mistake. His reference to witnesses against him infers his guilt. Brown does not relent. The following day, McNamara's jaw drops. His eyes widen. Drops of perspiration materialize on his forehead as his dollar movement girl, smart the guard in the beautiful fur coat he himself had bought her, walks into the courtroom and takes her place in the front row. McNamara cannot take his eyes from her. And then, faintly, from an empty room across the hall where Brown had placed him, the violinist, Roth, plays Troymeri. The sight of his beloved sweetheart the sound of his favorite song are too much for the nerve-wracked McNamara. Your Honor! Sit down, you fool. What are you going to do? Your Honor! Yes? Your Honor, I'm guilty. Stop all this waste of time. I can't prove my innocence when even she's against me. I did it, Your Honor. Sentence me now. I dynamited the tide. <laughs> consideration for McNamara's plea of guilty, the court sentenced him to San Quentin for life. Sam Brown's splendid detective work, combined with the operations of Walter Burnsand and his men in the East, brought justice to the entire dynamiting ring, whose operations had destroyed more than $7 million worth of property in all parts of the country. The guilty conspirators paid for their activities with jail sentences from seven years in the penitentiary to life sentences. Thank you, Chief Davis. Since the days of the Times bombing, the Los Angeles Police Department has grown tremendously. There are now hundreds of police cars in 24-hour service, all of them powered by Rio Grande cracked gasoline, exactly the same gasoline that you get whenever you drive into a Rio Grande station. Rio Grande furnishes this gasoline year after year because Los Angeles, like the many other cities and counties which specify Rio Grande crack for all emergency cars, has yet to find any gasoline to equal its economy and performance. If you think that all gasolines are pretty much the same, we ask you to make a 10-gallon test of Rio Grande crack and learn the meaning of police car performance. It costs not a cent more to enjoy the quicker start, quicker acceleration, and maximum power of Rio Grande crack. Ask our independent dealers for a free copy of the Calling All Cars News so you can get greater enjoyment from these radio programs. Ask about the Rio Grande Junior Police Department and learn how you can get 14 valuable free gifts to boys and girls of your acquaintance. A complete junior detective outfit at no charge. Sinclair Motor Oil is another example of the extra value you get at no extra cost when you patronize Rio Grande dealers. For these world-famous oils are de-waxed and de-jellied until all impurities and waste matter are removed leaving concentrated pure oil that is guaranteed to give positive lubrication in any weather at any speed. This is the same oil specified by 150 leading railroads, by leading airplane lines. Yet it costs as little as 25 cents a quart in refinery steel cans. You will find Sinclair motor oil everywhere the old brandy cracked gasoline is sold. Oh, 
Frederick Lindsley bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company.